Good evening, I'm Dichotomy. I am here to tell you all about the Pros v. Joe's game that we just had in B-Sides LV 2021, Camp Stay at Home. Uh, with me is a few of my staff. There's a lot of people who couldn't be here today, unfortunately, but we have some good representation from the red and the blue sides. We have Buzzsaw, who is here uh, from the blue side. We have Tectonic, who is another blue captain who played this year. And we have Endgame, who is one of our red fellows. Uh, again, we have so many people who build and run our games through the year. Uh, and I can't even name them all here. I encourage you to go to prosversusjoes.net to check that out. Uh, but for the next little while, we're going to tell you about the game we just ran with all of the Joes that we had and the amazing time we had uh, with this virtual game, uh, which is our ninth B-Sides LV, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so with that and without further ado, we'll get started. I'll give you a quick rundown on what the game is, what it is we're all about, and then more importantly, I'll let our good friends here, Buzzsaw, Tectonic, and Endgame, talk about the game and their experience, uh, and the, the, the Joes that they helped, and the experiences that had, were had in this game. Uh, so Pros vs. Joes is an educational experience. It is all about the training of those, the Joes, who are looking to grow their experience and their capabilities in the cybersecurity realm. Uh, we're part of the hacker community, and we try and teach those Joes through direct uh, involvement with the pros that we have on staff uh, and some of the pros that we might be able to recruit from the wild world. Uh, we do several games a year. Besides LV is our crown jewel, as we like to say. It is the premier game that we run. We're proud to be here. We love the Besides LV people, and we are so privileged to be part of that community. Uh, in our game, it is, again, a combat-based game where our Blue Joes defend a set of network assets that they are given to uh, by us. Uh, each There are four teams of Joes, typically, and two of our captains from this year are here, Buzzsaw and Tectonic. Uh, there were two other captain, uh, there were two other teams, uh, captained by Spike Roche and uh, Zero Decay and Overclock. Uh, but all of these teams faced off to uh, basically defend themselves against the Red. In our environment, the Red teams are given early access to the environment to emulate those advanced adversaries who have that advantage uh, and they are deeply persistent they have all kinds of c2 comms they have means to maintain control of the assets and the whole point of the game is for engagement between those blue joes and the red pros who then are going to give them grief for two days uh, there's a series of events that happen through the day which we'll get to but from uh, now let me stop talking and turn it over to our people to quickly introduce themselves with a little bit more uh, depth. I'm going to hand it over to Endgame for start from the red team, and then we'll hand it over to our blue brethren. So, Endgame? Sure thing. Yeah, so uh, I'm representing our, our red cell. We've got a, a great team of just some of the best uh, professional hackers that I've ever worked with. I learn a lot from these guys every year. Uh, it's just a privilege to be able to, to work with them and execute a lot of those TTPs uh, that Academy was mentioning. Um, so this year in particular, um, was a lot of a lot of fun uh, going through, and uh, for me, I, I personally I work a lot more on the Linux side, and I'm our, our web weenie, so that's kind of my role on the team. Uh, make sure all the web shells are deployed. I make sure all our typical persistent scripts are, are backdoored and up in there, uh, and it's just it's a ton of fun uh, watching the blue teams kind of wiggle around, and it's also even more fun uh, going and teaching and, and showing them where we can uh, some of these techniques it benefits everybody. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Bussa, how about over to you, sir? Um, sure. So this is a little into my second year with PBJ as a staff member. I had up our story ward working group and decided to captain one of the Blue Joes teams this year. Um, kind of what I've been doing the times when I've played hands-on keyboard in the game is kind of sitting there being abused by endgame on the Linux boxes. Um, just you know, constantly learning more and more things from them, um, from the other players who are on the team or in the team I captain this year. It, it really is just a constantly ongoing great environment and great tribe to be a member of to be able to learn and expand our knowledge. Fantastic. Thank you. Tectonic, how about you, my friend? Uh, how you doing, Tectonic? Uh, this is my 
fourth year uh, with PVJ, uh, third yeah. time captaining, and uh, you know I could echo everything. Um, always learning. Every time it's a learning experience, the game just keeps getting better and better. Uh, and like Buzz saw, uh, you know, trying to wriggle around uh, Endgame's uh, web shells. <laughs> <laughs> he's good at getting them in there, and uh, but he's also very good at uh, at, at teaching. You know, um, that interaction between the blue and the red uh, is also a massive learning experience. And uh, getting to see some of their side and getting that interaction is fantastic. Very good. Thank you, guys. Um, so with that, we'll get into it. I mean, it, 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 this is a little bit of a public hot wash. We had a private hot wash just uh, 20 minutes ago. It ran almost two hours with our Joes. Uh, that's kind of the, the apex of our game, right? You know, the, the, the Blue Joes and their captains, two of whom you see here, who are not here, are uh, besides those I've already mentioned. Nita Mulligan is not here. Uh, but so I think you only had Watchdog. a... A Watchdog, of course. Good yeah, heavens. Yeah. I'm tired. It's been a long time. Uh, very long game. Um, but in either case, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Watchdog has been fantastic all this time. Uh, but these guys, they captain their individual Joe teams, and they each, you know, the scoreboard was up there. You can find it on the Twitters, on the uh, B-Sides LV and the Pros v. Joe's uh, hashtags. Uh, they're all out there. But at the end of the day, we're going to go down a little bit of what Red Team did, uh, how Blue defended, and what this game is all about. So Endgame, why don't you tell us a little bit about those things from the Red perspective? Absolutely. So as we kind of uh, let off, a big part of the game is the fact that Red Cell has access already. So there are assets within the environment that do have things we can exploit. There's a lot of out-of-date software, a lot of default credentials, stuff like that. Uh, but the general idea is that Red's not really there to play the game. We're, we're, we're there to facilitate a conversation. We're there to drive the game direction, build up some banter between the teams, and give the blue team something to defend against. And um, so with that, we do have uh, a fair amount of access prior to game start, uh, where we really get to play around and experiment with uh, what exactly we want the blue teams to be defending against. And on the Windows side, that looks like a lot of really scary things. We have uh, iDigital Flame building some crazy Windows malware, crazy persistence mechanisms, and uh, we're not shy about C2 usage. We'll have, at least I know on the Windows side, three different C2 programs that we use and just fire them all back and whatever sticks, sticks, and that's where we run with it. So we, we play around with some new tooling here and there, and. Uh, from game to game, change up the tactics. But that on the Windows side, it's it's a lot of login, established persistence, default creds, mess a lot as, where we can with the sys internals to make sure we're staying there. And uh, for us in particular on that side, clear text credentials, any way we can get those, dumping your LSAS processes, SAM databases, and just funneling it back to our channels. That's that's what we're doing on the Windows side. And then on the Linux side, it's similar. It's the same kind of over overarching idea. We have that access. We'll set up SSH keys. We'll set up passwords and backdoor accounts. Very simple stuff. Uh, but then we'll also drop our C2 tools and our implants. And that can range from everything from a typical C2 tool that you'd see um, or use out in the wild if you're a red teamer. Or it can be crazy things like uh, backdooring a whole library for a particular system uh, or even just trying to uh, set suit binary so we can prove ask easily once we're back in. Uh, so that's kind of what, uh, in a nutshell, what we're doing and what it looks like. And from that perspective, when I, when I go into the game and when I play, I'm looking at all of the ways uh, we can really manipulate Linux and even BSD as operating systems. And one of my uh, most fun things to do that typically last most of the game is web shells. I've, I've joked about being the web weenie, uh, but that's, it's useful because, and it's, it's particularly useful because of those additional persistence mechanisms, those suet binaries, those other ways to get root that don't require exploitation. So we can get in easily reroute the box and then deploy the rest of our persistence all back over again and just keep cycling. So as long as we have one way in, we have five and it, it works out really well. Exactly. So now having said that, Buzzsaw and Tectonic, you and your teams, the two of the four, had faced off against Thing Game and his brother. And thoughts on that? Perspectives from your side of the fence? Yeah. Uh, I mean, one thing that I'd like to point out is, uh, you know, um, that th uh, three, or re three or four weeks or so that uh, Red Team has prior uh, access um, really does give, uh, uh, you know, uh, an angle of that, that uh, 
uh, that APT effect, right? But um, what we're also doing on the blue side is we have our teams, we draft our teams, and we go into training mode. Um, so, you know, we're prepping, we're learning, we're, we're, we're teaching, we're having different working groups and different sessions uh, to kind of lead up to the game time to try to get our team as prepared as possible. Um, you know, we don't give away too much uh, because we want them to be a little bit uh, excited and, and, and shell-shocked a little bit, um, but we, we lead them in the right direction. Um, so, you know, we, get, we once the game starts, it's all hands on deck, the boxes come out, and... Uh, we're digging in, and like uh, like Endgame was saying, there's multiple levels of persistence. So it's not just about patching the boxes or putting rules uh, on the firewall, right? Um, it's about getting them in, uh, 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 doing the threat hunting, getting them out, getting their persistence out, and trying to keep them out. Uh, because, like Endgame said, they're gonna if they have one way in, they have five. So that's that's the whole aspect of it, right? Exactly. No, I couldn't agree more. But so, how about your perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll keep, kind of keep digging into where Tectonic left uh, left off there. Um, you know, perspective of the idea, yeah, you get into threat hunting. Um, so it is starting to try and identify where the misconfigurations are, where the weaknesses are in the system. Um, and, you know, again, being on the Linux CLI the entire time over the last 30 odd hours and last year as well, you start off with the easy things, right? We start off looking, who are the users? Who looks weird? Who doesn't look like they belong on this box? Um, you know, setting RSA keys if you're going to leave those or cleaning those out, setting backup accounts. Um, then you start digging deeper down into that hardening and configuration role. Um, you know, I, I work in GRC, that's my day to day job, and configuration management and knowing what you have and what it's supposed to do is really where I try and focus helping our clients out. Um, and I try to carry that in here, try to get you know, my team that we led in our prep, our couple weeks of prep, tried to get them into the idea of, all right, learn, focus in, here's CIS benchmarks, which you can go sign up and grab for free. Um, start looking through these, right? Start studying, you'll, I'm sure you'll talk about it more, MITRE attack framework to see what is that flow into a persistent state um, and how can we find those persistence mechanisms in some way, shape or form, even if it's just the behavior what can we look for within a generic CentOS system or Ubuntu system? What can we look for in a Win12 DC? Um, you know, things like that. So that's where our team went to prep was down that route. Um, I did kind of want to bring up, it, it crossed my mind while Tectonic was speaking there. Our team really had a good gamut of, um, I would say, early career security folks down to the true joes you know a couple of kids who were still in college um and a lot of them weren't really hands-on cli this year which was okay they were all at least for you know a, a good chunk of the time involved watching over people's shoulders um we set up a discord server we had multiple chat channels going on where we were using those to kind of do our documentation about what we were doing to our boxes we had a couple of the video and audio channels available so people could share screens talk about linux talk about windows uh, when purple teaming turned on this morning we had a channel kind of devoted just to that so we had our three or four people who had some offensive experience started diving down there and started working out how can they get around to uh, finding vulnerabilities on other team servers how can we exploit them how can we get in and send up the flares that red team had been uh, kind of running roughshod all over us for the last 24 hours so yeah, yeah that's my statement there Excellent. So there's a couple of comments, I, uh, concepts there that you threw out that I want to draw out and, and make sure. sure that our viewers understand. And one is the purple time, right? So as I said yep. at the beginning, um, and no, that's great that you brought it up. Don't, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, it's Blue Joes who are defending assets, you know, web servers, mail servers, DNS, uh, desktops, Windows, Linux, the like against, you know, uh, end game and his like and uh, but you know on, on the other hand about midpoint of the game this purple time we speak of is where blue gets to go red and they get to have some fun with the offensive side and I think it, it, that both you and Tonic would agree the Joe's really little forward to that right who doesn't yes. love a little bit of offense uh, and so that's what uh, our, our good friend Buzzsaw meant when he was talking about that purple time 
Uh, and then lastly, oh, what was that other thing you were talking about? There? Scorchers. Oh, the fire, the beacons um, that you mentioned, right? So in our environment, we have a scoring engine that looks at health and welfare time, and it makes sure that those services, web, DNS, all those other things, mail, are up and running. We also check for remote services, uh, remote access services like SSH and RDP uh, because of some game mechanic things, but also just to make sure that, you know, these things are running, and that's how teams accumulate their points in our game. So what, what a red team can do, or a purple blue team can do in the second half of our game is when they have control of an asset of a given defending team, like Buzzsaw's team or Tectonic's team or whoever's, they can set up a flare and they can basically call back to the scoring engine a simple transmission to say, I'm in control of this asset. And so the scoring engine will acknowledge that, will deduct some points, and it's just kind of a way through the game mechanics to acknowledge that this team hasn't quite expunged all of the offensive elements, whether they be true red or the purple blues that happen in the second half of the game. Uh, so with that, uh, Tectonic, any thoughts on that before we go back to Endgame for some of his uh, deeper views of the offensive side of things? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing that you, you just said is, you know, the, the, a lot of the Joes like, like that aspect. And the one thing I can say is I know this from experience and even earlier today, uh, someone that obviously doesn't do this every day for, of their life got their first web shell uh, uh, uploaded to a box and got um, a callback. And he, you know, a good exclamation, oh, my God, it worked, you know, right on the Zoom channel. And <laughs> and having that feeling and being able to experience, because I remember when I did that in my uh, in my first PVJ, right? Um, it's, it's unlike any other CTF I've experienced. You got your, your Hack the Boxes, you got your other um, Jeopardy-style CTFs, and... You have walkthroughs or it is a single state box. There is so much going on with the PVJ game that you're not you're pivoting back and forth from, um, you know, uh, defending a box, maybe a firewall, uh, Windows, Linux, and, and then being able to go offensive and use potentially use some exploits or maybe even some RSS, uh, RS, uh, SSH keys that you pulled that red team was using on <laughs> other other machines. It, it's it, it's an experience unlike ever uh, uh anything else i've experienced so you know that aspect of the game is fantastic fantastic so uh, end game it's about time we get back to you and your then the red side of life uh any thoughts or any maybe things you'd like to start sharing about your ttps and so forth your tactics techniques and procedures yeah so my favorite part of this game was a hundred percent the firewalls so towards the end of the game and th this is always a, a red cell strategy because this is how we make the fireworks happen when scorched earth comes um as long as we can maintain control of the firewalls uh towards the end of the game or at least the majority of them we'll make the scoreboard go red immediately and it just spooks everybody for a minute it's tons of fun so that's always a priority of mine um working on the linux side but before we dove into that and really started focusing on on sinking our teeth further than we already had um there was a fun idea to um and, and this may sound more like a troll than, than it is a tactic but it <laughs> ended up being a, a really great surprise tactic um i think it was uh found it or another red cell member who uh suggested that we throw party parrot into uh, the bash prompt, right? Uh, normally we have we have a destructive payload for Scorched Earth that just completely wipes your console and party parrot all day. But we wanted something safe, uh, really simple. It was just a curl call. But where we what we did is we put it in with the rest of our bash persistence. So I'll, I'll, I'll allude to some of the bash persistence with this. Uh, inside your bash RC, uh, we have stashed quite a few things, uh, anywhere from three to five mechanisms, and they look nice and happy, safe. They look like a normal bash profile. It's because they are, and they make a call reference to whatever you were expecting after executing our stuff. Uh, so it's kind of hard to uh, walk through and really find them unless you know something isn't supposed to be there. So it's hiding in plain sight. Well, the parrot, party parrot's really easy to spot because it's called parrot.live. Uh, but what that did was we had a delay after. So you had to watch party parrot unless you knew to cancel out. <laughs> you had to watch party parrot for at least five seconds. Me as a red teamer, I know you have to do that. So if I know you're getting back in your box and I'm not quite done with my persistence yet and you keep kicking me out and we've been going back and forth, if I can get that in there, that's five more seconds I have that you don't to go play <laughs> malware and that's all I need. Um, so that was a great, ended up being a troll that turned into a tactic for me anyway. I used it a lot. Um, that was just supposed to be fun. 
Um, and in a similar vein, I couldn't get uh, because the PF Sense boxes are so old, you can't curl things like you normally do. Hard to install packages. So what I did uh, is I took my birthday cake malware that I'm sure some of you guys saw, uh, and I just edited it in manually and did the same sleep technique on the firewalls too to buy myself time. And that again proved worthy uh, because once we had we had all the firewalls backdoored already, but they kept changing the credentials, which I didn't like very much. Um, so <laughs> one of the techniques that we used is I made a backup of the master password file. And I set all the creds back to the default admin pfSense or root pfSense. Uh, and any time the creds would get reset uh, and we couldn't SSH back in, well, I had a web shell. And I would just go drop the master password, update the database, and I can get back in with admin pfSense. That worked all day yesterday. Started getting caught on to us towards the, the morning of today. Uh, so Children of Annette had the great idea. Well, let's just drop SSH keys. Nobody thinks about SSH keys on pfSense. And sure enough... No one noticed we had SSH keys on PFSense the entire time. On top of that, all the web shells that I had at the start of the game in weeks prior, well, we only had one. We had one backup web shell. And when we started to notice some more activity, people really defending their PFSense boxes, um, I dropped two more in, in conspicuous locations. Uh, but I didn't even need to. We had SSH keys and that, that one starting web shell the whole time that let us maintain persistence on the firewalls up until the end of the game where we could shut them down and make the scoreboard go to red. So that was that was probably my favorite part and some of the insights to the TTPs through that that I got out of this game personally. Nice. So Buzz on uh, Tectonic, uh, any thoughts on that? All his levels of persistence and belts and suspenders all the way down kind of thing? I was just here for the giggles, man. It, 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 was, <laughs> it was tons of fun. I swear I found one of your RSA keys on PFSense this afternoon, but probably not all of them. I think I think you're right. I think you did because there was one team I had to kept echoing it back in, but that was what the web shell was for. And if you're not aware, <laughs> uh, the web shells on PFSense run as root, so I get a root shell in the browser, and it's just, uh, I can yeah, do I need, I, I need to look into web shells. It's another <laughs> thing I got to look into from the defensive side. You know, we talked about it in the other hot wash too. You know, file integrity things, um, checking the binaries. It's it, there's constantly going to be something uh, for those of us who play you know, full time blue or even part time blue again. Diving back to the purple side, um, there there's never going to be an end to our learning, and uh, you know, red, you guys are the great teachers for it. Exactly, tectonic. Any thoughts to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I I, I after the game finished, I I, uh, I had a sidebar with. Uh, uh, needs a mulligan, and as you said, I, I'm, for the next game, I'm learning, you know, um, uh, BSD and regular shell because <laughs> I hate maneuvering around that, that BF sense, you know. So it's going to force me to learn something so that I know it for the next game and just dive deeper and, and add to the toolkit. Um, and I was fighting the end game for a while in in, in our. Uh, uh, in our PF sense, and finally he went to go uh, shut uh, or reboot it, and I just canceled the reboot, and I locked him <laughs> out, and he couldn't get back into his stuff. So the firewall was still past traffic at the end of the game, but it was just not in a good state. So <laughs> that was that was fun. That was fun. Nice. Very good. Um, so I guess uh, from the blue side, what are some of your tactics in general? What are some of the things that you saw that Red Team did that really caught your attention? Good, good, Tectonic. No, you, you go. Oh. Um, I mean, I'll, so I've talked a lot about Linux, um, and I'll do my best to remember what all the teams said about the Windows side, and, uh, you know, Endgame, you could probably speak for Dig and some of his his teams, that side of the team. Um, there was something running, and I for everything that we, you know, I use Windows on a day-to-day -day basis, it's just Chrome and Excel and Word, but, you know, I'm not digging into PowerShell, I'm not an AD admin, the amount of persistence and when in the private hot wash uh maybe it was pookie disclosed the number of mechanisms he had it just shocked everybody um you know it's my team was rooting through stuff they were trying to find process chains they were trying to find executables that were doing things that were constantly respawning you know the matt damon the spider-man accounts jane whoever else uh, you know we, we sadly did not see the resurgence of kyle this year maybe next year maybe next game we'll, we'll save him a couple kyle, monsters like saw matt damon i think right that happened yeah we'll we'll leave that discussion between matt damon and jeremy renner to twitter um <laughs> and i i really you know 
probably should have put Matt Damon back in uh, Normandy after we found him, but um, <laughs> uh, no, no. So, you know, uh, from the window side, the team definitely spent a lot of time over there um, investigating and learning. They, uh, you know, one of the things we stressed um, in our prep was Google will be your friend, your, your browser and Google will get a workout over this 36 hour period. And it definitely sounded like it for all the chatter that I was overhearing among that side of my team. Um, they were looking, they were trying to find out, trying to find explanations for what was causing this constant resurgence of a hundred Matt Damon accounts or this, that, or the other <laughs> over on, on, uh, you know, uh, the Windows side. And very similarly on Linux side, right, um, you know, alluded to some of your binaries there in game that you know, would constantly spawn back out and just let you back in on root. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's constantly looking for that. And it's like, all right, what, what's doing this? Um, you know, I've looked through the common places I would know for, uh, for SSH keys. I would do a find trying to find text for an RSA key. I uh, just, you know, all through the directories and got lost at a certain point, And that's where the limit of my knowledge was over the weekend. So now it's, okay, I see where the next steps are and hopefully the rest of the team, as they learned, they heard from the private hot wash, anybody going to watch this, they're hopefully going to start seeing, you know, a little bit less of that fog of war ahead of them and their knowledge. And they can start picking that up and going from there doing whatever else, more PBJ in the future, other CTFs, learn more, see what else is out there. Cool. No, very good. Very well said. Um, back to you on the red side. What were some of the interesting things you saw Blue do to defend, detect, expunge your team, things like that? Yeah. So one of the the things that really really put a put a stick in things. Uh, I can't remember which team, but not only it, pretty much any Linux boxes that Blue teams could legitimately remove some of the baseline persistence, the fake users, the SSH keys, items like that, that didn't have some kind of service exposure other than SSH. Maybe it was the DNS server. Maybe it was just uh, a puzzle box or something like that. Those systems were a lot easier for them to lock down if they got rid of the base persistence, because then our only way back in was our C2, which did last most, but I did notice one or two boxes did get completely removed and that could have been network controls because even if you can't mitigate uh, the removal or even if you can't fully remove every single binary and process we have in your system if you cleaned up your bash profile if you remove the backdoor accounts and remove the SSH keys even if we have rogue binaries still living uh, if you're monitoring that traffic and killing those connections manually that's all you have left to do um, and that's you know it's a mitigation, but it's a mitigation that works pretty effectively. And I did notice that on at least one team, there was for most teams we maintain access to at least 80% of the Linux boxes all the time, except for one towards the end we only had like four or five left. Okay, here's a question for you: Do you think patching is a value for blue teams in Pros v Joe? Certainly in the real world, it's a value, but in our game, do you think it's a significant uh, factor? Um, only if you have time, because at least on the Linux side, patching will spawn more shells for us. <laughs> you want to yeah, there was, there was a lot of stuff like PF Sense, which you couldn't patch or update either. Sure, sure. Well, it, yeah, and like I would say the, the one benefit patching does have is it removes our last ditch efforts at getting uh, a, a privileged access, uh, which we often don't ever have to use. I think there's been one game about two years ago where I actually had to like exploit Dirty Cow to get root again. I had like one <laughs> web shell left, there were no other ways back on the root, so from a web shell, I had kernel exploit back into but most of the time our persistence our sued binaries all the backdoor binaries we have to just elevate the root are still there so we we don't use uh any exploits most of the time which makes patching kind of like probably the last thing you should do if in my opinion i would clean up your configs first that's going to matter a lot more excellent anything from the blue side on that point i i just think that you know i think that was brought to light um, across my team uh, this year, you know, uh, the the objective, even speaking to the entire team, was you know let's go in, let's harden the boxes, let's patch, let's make sure everything's up to date, um, and you know jumping in and then starting uh, to actually have to react and see all these different things, um, you know, it was it became more of well how are these how are these continuing to spawn, um, you know, we stopped this process, how's this happening, and it becomes a um, 
uh, you know, a deeper dive into the configs rather than just, you know, let's update this and, and mitigate this vulnerability. It's not just about patching for vulnerabilities. It's about hunting the threat and rooting them out. Excellent. Okay. So real quick, actually, here's a thought. Let's kind of take it back to Blue, but ask Blue about offense. Tell us about your purple time, right? You know, so the Joes were chomping at the bit. I kept getting requests, when's purple time? When's purple time? God. Well, okay, so tell us any, do you have any stories for us about the, the Blue Joe's experience doing offensive action? Um, our team didn't really get into much of the offensive stuff, especially any any sort of effectiveness, until probably noonish, one o'clock, um, which point uh, one of the teams um, still had some exposed hosts, and... I think one of them, they forgot to update a couple of the newest hosts' default creds, so we were able to get in. Um, I don't remember if they had a persistence that we dropped in there or what it was, um, but we were able to be sending up a couple flares here and there, and it seemed to make those folks happy. Um, you know, Again, I, I, I threw one in at the end. I fork-bombed somebody uh, during Scorched Earth. Um, just for the heck of it, right? It's like, what can I do to make this real fun? I'm, I'm done trying to send flares. Uh, so uh, fork bomb somebody and nuke the server. Um, but no, no. So, the, yeah, the, the couple of folks who were in it um, who were actively hands-on keyboard doing it had fun. And like I mentioned earlier, right, we had Discord up. Um, we had some of the folks who wanted to see how it was done observing. And then I know we haven't talked really about the storefront element, the PBJ, either. Um yeah. Uh, but this is a good one, too. You know, we at 2 o'clock pulled the trigger and said, hey, we're going to get a red cell person just to help us, simply for the offensive side for the most part, really. Um, they're like, hey, you know, we help our guys out, teach them enumeration, teach them what to do once they've found a vuln. Because we didn't really have anybody on our team who'd had a wealth of offensive experience uh, or, you know, gone through an OSCP cert exam or practice or anything like that. So enumeration wasn't really uh, an intimate concept to them. Um, even the how to's, let alone just what the concept of it was. But I think they learned, I think they had fun. Excellent. Uh, so real quick, Tectonic, I do want to get back to you on your purple experience, but because Buzzsaw, you brought up, the question of red team consulting and do let, let me also take a moment to dwell on the storefront that you brought up which is an outstanding thing to bring up that's an element of our game um for those who have not played our game before we have a storefront a, a basically a little zen card that's gold team run the game administrators and blue teams can spend points they earn through their uptime to buy advantages it could be another asset that they get scored for, that they, if they maintain uptime, they can drive up their score even faster. Uh, there's a number of other things. Founded This Way has been the maintainer and the developer of that storefront technology. Uh, but what they, the Blues can do is buy consulting hours from the red team. So like Endgame here, I know took a couple hours here and there to help the blue teams. And uh, Endgame, I remember you talking in Slack about uh, the experience you had with consulting with the blues. Yeah, absolutely. The the from the red team's perspective, and I, I think Brimstone uh, would also echo this. It's just a lot of fun to get in and see how see exactly where the blue team's at because they're coming to you with a specific question about a specific service or problem usually, and then they're able to go from there. I I, I was working, uh, I believe, with uh, Buzzsaw's team, um, and at one point. Uh, sitting on the, the bind box is what we were there to kind of diagnose and walking through, but we also had another teammate that was working on a completely different box, and they were kind of connecting the dots. Things were clicking, like, oh, this is the same on both of these, and I want to look for these things here. I'm like, yep, it's it's all the same. You can almost call it a tactics, techniques, and procedures for the blue team to be identifying these things. Um, and it's just a lot of fun to be able to get in there and help teach and observe exactly what's going on and see those light up moments because i i get those from the red team all of our all of our captains all of our senior members uh, children of a knit had me running through building all kinds of crazy versions of bsd trying to get some mail order compile it was a whole thing so i learned from that way and so my way to pass it on is through stuff like the consultation for the blue team and it's just awesome to see that because i know how i feel when i learn something new can Absolutely. I jump in with a real quick question for Endgame there? So yep. you mentioning that it, it wasn't our team that you were consulting with. I think we had yeah. Dig or maybe it was Brimstone. It was, it was you guys, Tectonic. It was Tectonic. Yeah. But so you may, yeah. So you mentioned though that you know you were consulting on the box and the blue team was observing the similar things on the other box. 
is it something and this is more a question for any blue observers is it a trap that red team starts falling into about a similar behavior or at least within our game environment, do you guys have such a wealth of tooling available to you that you typically aren't getting caught in that, I'm used to doing it this way, I'm gonna continue? Yes, yeah, so you'll you'll notice not only in the way that we conduct activities on the box, but also in the way many of our team members speak when, when conducting hot washes, we're vague on purpose about certain yeah. things. And those are things that work across all games. However, the stuff that we burn, that we share, that is the same thing, uh, first off, they tend to still work pretty well, too. But when they don't, that gives red team opportunity to grow. So there are things we purposely want to burn so that way we can improve our tooling. It gives us an excuse to build better tools, try new tactics. I know Dig is going crazy with, with minor attack framework. It's awesome <laughs> what he's doing. And um, so that that's that's kind of our perspective on it. We, we withhold to ourselves what we know we want to keep, and we're willing to share whatever else, and we kind of trial and error. We'll keep it through the same some games like we pretty much use the same toolkit from the May at home game that we did here with some minor modifications. Everything still worked as long as everything continues to work. We don't care that we, we told you because we'll try it again. And once it stops working, once you got, once the blue teams really start picking up on those TTPs, we'll, we'll switch them out. Yeah. And if I could jump in right there, you know, um, having that experience, cause it was myself, uh, and, uh, uh, Two other people. Uh, first, it started with just me and one other person working on the bind box, and then he was working on the mail and the samba box at the same time. Um, and two things: one, we we wanted to be vague in our questioning because we didn't want answers; we wanted direction, right? And I think that that helped us. But also, even when we were saying, even with that guidance, if we were like, "Hey, is this it?" You know, it was they don't just give you the answer, and it makes you think about it, and makes you find. Uh, the path, dig in deeper, and, and really learn why it is a certain way. So he, it, it, the red team might show you where the road starts, but you have to travel down it yourself to figure it all out. Outstanding. And with that, actually, why don't you go ahead and tell us about your team's purple time, if you had anything to note to share that uh, with the audience. Yeah, so unfortunately, we, we ended up losing a couple of people, um, so we were uh, a little light. So um, a few of us that wanted to go red, myself including, didn't have the chance. But like I said earlier, there were a couple of people that did, and uh, two people got shells. Uh, we didn't end, end up popping beacons because we ended up executing that later in the game. Um, but they got shells, and I, it was their first shells in a live event like this you know so he, being able to he, even to get that far uh and seeing the excitement and the, and them getting engaged and them talking to each other well what did you do and oh where'd you put the web shell how did you create the account oh did you get the privilege escalation yet and you just you see the chatter you hear it you look it's just it's a that's why i do this that's why i keep coming back <laughs> being able to see that being able to be a part and help facilitate that and that teamwork and that uh that action it, it's it's yeah, absolutely. Very glad you do, and both of you and all of the staff, and I'm glad for all the Joes that come in. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, so we're running down on time. i got an eye on the clock here. Let's start talking about Scorched Earth, that last phase of the event. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for those who don't know, the Scorched Earth is the last hour of the game. And that's a, a tradition we've had for a number of years now, and basically, as I say in the game, smoke them if you got them. Uh, there's a number of requirements and restrictions that red and the offensive blues, when they go purple, cannot do because it would break the game. You know, it's not a whole lot of fun if someone locks you out of your box and you can't do anything. Um, but in that last hour, after they spent 30 some hours in this, uh, you know, in this hackathon that we do virtually, or the two days that we do on site in places, or even one day, we give everyone a chance to blow off some steam. And red and blue alike, who have have grabbed assets they are in that last hour at liberty to do whatever they want to those boxes so brimstone got to start with you on the red side what are some of the scorched earth experiences where you just blew things up for the funsies oh man uh so on the linux side of things so so i was i was first and foremost uh supposed to uh shut down all the firewalls like i mentioned so i, I was on that but i was told to wait which was the most infuriating thing ever, because of course I want to shut everything down. <laughs> make it go right. There was a reason for that. Uh, the reason is so we could deploy our um, 
all of our, the rest of our score strength tools. So we have a couple of different things. Uh, some we deploy throughout the game that are trolls, such as we have a Missy Elliott payload that everybody seems to love. Anything that any output you have displayed to the terminal is up, down, flipped, and reversed. Great to work with. Uh, then, of course, there's the birthday cake troll, there's the party parrot, there's uh, no more secrets, which will do the uh, decrypt in text, just like um, from the movie. And uh, the big thing, though, is our party parrot destructive payload, and that'll take over your entire TTY for all your consoles and just party parrot loop forever, and you can't log into it. <laughs> so we get all that deployed first, then we shut down the firewalls and make everything go red, and if you can come back up, you get just nothing but parrot consoles. So that's what it looks yeah. like from the Linux side. From the Windows side, we're deploying... Uh, the Angry Goose, we're deploying uh, Rickroll in your task manager where all your processes are just the lyrics to, to the Rickroll song. Uh, we're Neon Cat backgrounds wiping your console. That's what it looks like on the Windows side. So it's a lot more visual on the uh, on the, the Windows side for sure. And of course, benefit for the folks who have never played our game, we give console access through the hypervisor Proxmox that we use for. So even though their firewall's down, they have full view of all these wonderful, glorious trolls that uh, Red deploys. Uh, real quick, Buzzsaw and Tectonic, what are your perspectives on Scorched Earth there? Go ahead, Ben. It, so literally six minutes into Scorched Earth, I, I start <laughs> IMing Endgame because I knew he was in the fire room. I was like, six minutes? Really? Six minutes? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, I didn't even want to wait that long. But yeah, I mean, it's... um. It, that board goes red. You know it's the firewall right away, and yep. then you got to try to fight with them to get it back. I ended up getting getting it back, you know, when we were fighting with the rest of the boxes. But it's uh, once you play the game a couple of times, you look forward to it because after a 36-hour event, getting to see what the the red team is actually capable of. I mean, we're these are some of the smartest guys I've ever worked with. Um, and, and dealt with and just to be able to see what they can do really and how far they can take it at the end of the game after the end of the 36 hours it's a ton of fun everybody gets a laugh out of it so even though the boards are going red at that point it's 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 awesome to witness outstanding but so how about you yeah, well, mostly the same year. Um, I know this year I kind of, well, it happened. My wife brought me dinner <laughs> right about Scorched Earth time. So I kind of sat back knowing what was going to happen. Um, let somebody else kind of who wanted to play on the firewall some more play on the firewall. And I swear, I, I sang you happy birthday on the command line. I don't know if you saw it. Um, I, I, full, full, full four, layer, full four lines. I did, I promise. Um, but it's it, it, like Tectonic said, right? It's, you know... Everything starts going haywire. Um, we're still running beacons. And that was the nice thing to... Excuse me, flares is our term now. Um, we're still running flares. We still have access to some of the other blue team's hosts. And it is it is kind of fun dropping one of them. You know, seeing it go full fully offline from a fork bomb or from RMRF. Uh, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and it was... I had to remind my team, like, hey, it is okay now to burn them completely, by all means, and expect it to be done to us. You know, don't just be sending flares. Um, but no, it, it's it, it's a fun last little hour to see just how crazy things get and just how well you might be able to pull out a last-ditch defense. Yeah. No, that's outstanding. Uh, so I want to take a hot minute here to real quick name the Pros v. Joe's staff who make this happen. Uh, I'm going to name the people who directly participated and supported this B-Sides LV this year. I would encourage people to go to prosversusjoes.net and look at the full staff listing. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, these are the people who we listed for credit for supporting LB this year. I need to give them props because this game does not happen without them. These three people you see plus me are just the tip of the iceberg. And I'm just the schmuck who says a lot of things and does a lot of whatever. These folks are the people who make it happen. So Captain Opsec, Veloce Ventura, Gabe the Engineer, Huzar, Old School Noise, Phantasm, Mateer, Zero Bit Smith, Misfit, Uplink, Watchdog, Zero Decay, Buzzsaw, Needs a Mulligan, Overclock, Spike Roche, Starling, Whisper, Imposter, Malware Mama, DMFR, Tectonic, Quicksand, TiVo, Promina, Founded This Way, iDigital Flame, Niden, Noob, Endgame, Children of a Knit, Huffy, Brimstone, and Mark. Gentlemen, did I miss anybody? off my call i think you got okay it. 
Um, we have also another big thanks to give to our sponsors. Gigamon has been a fantastic sponsor who has supported us tremendously with cash donations and with all kinds of other support. Their Threat Insight was deployed in this game and they did a great deal for the blue teams. And we cannot thank them enough for all the things that they have done for us. Rapid7 is a late edition sponsor who has also helped us. And we are very thankful for their efforts. There have been other sponsors over the years. In fact, I should call out Wilmington University who has hosted all of our uh, B-Sides games from the beginning of time and continues to be a strong, silent partner with our hacker tribe. And we thank them all for their tremendous support. Uh, and with that, let me turn it back to this crew here and ask if anyone has any final thoughts or things they want to close with. Uh, Huffy, let's start with Red Team and then close with our blue friends. Yes, yeah, so... That's end game. I'm so sorry. No, I'll, I'll tell you, you call me Huffy? That's a compliment. <laughs> All right. No, you are. I called you Brimstone now. Does that even amount? Ah. <laughs> um, sorry, end game. Go. Yeah, so... Uh, more, more or less uh, just the learning experience. On all sides, you learn something, and that's why I keep coming back. I started playing PVJ as a Blue Joe uh, under Awe was my team captain, and that just sky I, I got more experience, uh, I say like 20 years of experience playing the game than I have in any on-the-job training I've done. And every time I play Red Cell, I bring these back to my day job. I'm a pen tester at my day gig. All of the tools we use, I can bring back and use at work, and I learn something every time I play. Beautiful. Lovely. Uh, Buzzsaw, how about you, sir? Um, it's kind of echo what Endgame said. You know, it, it, this is absolutely a bi-directional learning environment, and it's it's been superb for me. Um, you know, it's been hopefully superb for the team I was with last year, the team I was with this year, and I mentioned it on the private hot wash, mentioned it again here. Um, anybody who wants a career in security, find some time to dabble in both areas as much as you can, because both sides will help you to better your knowledge, better your abilities, and become a better all-around security professional. Outstanding. Oh, one more. Eat it's broad. <laughs> exactly. Always. Dev is broad. Always. Tectonic, how about you, sir? Uh, just echoing a lot of the same, you know, and I've said it uh, earlier, too, but um, uh, one thing I will say is I, I, I fully believe that, um, you know, participating in this um a few years ago has by no means um i mean by every mean helped me get to where i am in my career um it was a huge part of it it's like endgame said 20 years of experience in a matter of you know days or or over the last couple of years and uh being able to give that back to the teams that i can now captain and seeing them uh grow and have that same experience is it's it's fantastic and i'm i'm proud to be a part of this family outstanding and i i can't thank you guys enough all the pbj tribe and staff you guys are a tremendous hacker family i love you all uh, i do want to give a shout out and a thanks to b-sides lb for having us as you ever do now uh, pablo our silent producer here caspian the head of contests and events and so many people on the on the b-sides lb staff that uh, those of you watching this, enjoying the B-Sides LV virtual conference, please take a moment to thank a staffer. Enjoy the conference. Learn, grow. If Pros v. Joe's interest you, we invite you to any of our future games. We try and do this as often as we can. We want to give back to the community and help out. You've seen some of the amazing people that we have on staff and so many more you couldn't get to meet. But we want to thank you for your time. We want to thank everyone who played, the Joes, the Reds, the Blues, the Golds, everybody. Uh, this has been tremendous, and we are so excited to continue to support the community, all the B-sides that we play at, and we are just very thrilled to be part of it all. So with that, thank you. This is Dichotomy signing off. Game over. Have a good night.